Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Nermi, you may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This morning we talked about how the premeditation theory doesn't make any sense. We talked about Ms. Arias's description of self-defense. We talked about how something could have happened in that moment in time. Now, your jury instructions do not limit you to one of those two outcomes. You're the finder of fact. You determine what happened. What happened between those two photographs I showed you this morning? What happened? In that regard, you have more options than merely first-degree murder. Page 8 of your jury instructions talk about the crime of second-degree murder. When someone intentionally caused the death of another person, the defendant caused the death of another person by conduct which knew would cause death or serious physical injury or Under circumstances manifesting in stream, indifference to human life, the defendant recklessly engaged in conduct that created a grave risk of death. The risk must be such that disregarding it was a gross deviation from what a reasonable person in the defendant's situation would have done. Now, ladies and gentlemen, one of the more crucial parts of this jury instruction comes in the next paragraph. The difference between first-degree murder and second-degree murder is that second-degree murder does not require premeditation by the defendant. If you determine that the defendant is guilty of either first-degree murder or second-degree murder, and you have reasonable doubt as to which, you must find the defendant guilty of second-degree murder. Those are your instructions, as it was pointed out to you yesterday, not optional. The instructions you must follow. Going down farther on page 9, we have a manslaughter. Sudden quarrel or heat of passion. That could also sound very familiar to what we've, we've seen throughout the course of this trial, right? If and only if you find the elements of second-degree murder were proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you must then consider whether the homicide was committed upon a sudden quarrel or heat of passion resulting from adequate provocation from the victim. Adequate provocation means circumstances that deprive a reasonable person of self-control. And it does say, words alone, are not adequate provocation to justify reducing an intentional killing to manslaughter. There couldn't have been a cooling off period for which, in this case, Miss Arias could have regained control. If, after finding the elements of second degree murder were proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you also unanimously find beyond a reasonable doubt that the homicide was not committed upon a sudden quarrel or heat of passion 
resulting from adequate provocation, then you find the defendant guilty of second degree murder. But if you find the elements of second degree murder were proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you must also unanimously find beyond a reasonable doubt that the homicide was committed upon a sudden quarrel or heat of passion with adequate provocation. You don't find Miss Aries guilty of second degree murder, but of manslaughter. And it says, finally, if you determine the defendant is guilty of either second degree murder or manslaughter, but you have reasonable doubt as to which it was, you must find the defendant guilty of manslaughter. So ladies and gentlemen, as these instructions show you, your job is not limited to these two choices that we talked about this morning. And in that regard, let's be honest. There is no doubt about the fact that each party, the party of the state, promoting their agenda, or promoting the theory of first degree murder, there is an agenda behind that. There is a motivation behind that. They want you to convict Jody Arias of first degree murder. Miss Arias, too, there's no doubt about it. The state talked about it yesterday. There's no doubt about it. She's facing first degree murder charges. There's no doubt about the fact that she would have every incentive to lie, right? No doubt about it. It is your job to determine, and we talked about the evidence of self-defense, whether that evidence, the objective evidence you've heard, fits that story. And whether you believe her, you still have the right to believe her. But there is another voice. Another voice which has no agenda. The voice of reason. See, ladies and gentlemen, you are not required to check your common sense at the door. As a matter of fact, you are supposed to take it back to the jury room and to your deliberations, your experiences and your common sense to help you as a finder of fact to determine what happened between the photograph Jody Arias was taking of Mr. Alexander sitting in the shower and the moment in time when he was, his body was being dragged across the bathroom. In that regard, before we talk about some of those things and those objective indicators, we're going to look at crime scene photographs. We're going to look at evidence for which there is no dispute. The tell also. Th these items also tell a tale. But let's not forget that this, even the voice of reason, even your common sense, even these objective indicators will tell you that this is still a tale of fear, a tale of love, a tale of sex, a tale of lies, and a tale of dirty little secrets. What we need to do when we talk about this objective evidence, analyze, we need to take, you know, stock, I guess, if you will, of all the things, you know, we have these two pictures. Travis in the shower and his body being dragged across the bathroom floor. But outside of those two pictures, and even outside of the pictures on June 4th, we have the context of this entire relationship, don't we? <clears throat> you know, one of you or your fellow jury members who weren't, or who may not be here, there was a question posed a couple of times. I think once to Miss LaViolette and once to Jody herself. And the question was something to the effect, and it was worded differently both times, but did Jody and Travis have a love-hate relationship? That was the question. And I think it's a fair one. Objection. Sustained. Rephrase. The question is a fair one. But it seems that, well, there have certainly been elements of love, right? We've seen elements of love in this relationship. We saw both Jody and Travis on New Year's Day express how much they loved each other. 
We heard elements of love. We read them in the text messages. We saw them in Jody's journal. I love Travis Alexander. And we saw expressions of love from Travis Alexander, text messages. Did he love Jody? He told her she did. But he definitely loved having sex with her. We know that. Is there elements of hate? Maybe. See, maybe Jody hated herself for some of the boundaries she crossed, even though she said she enjoyed it and participated in it. Maybe she hated herself for crossing some of those boundaries. And maybe Travis Alexander hated himself for crossing some of those boundaries, too. Hated the fact that he wanted to keep having sex with Jody Aries. Maybe so. But whether this relationship was one of love and hate, the love-hate relationship that your question posed, there can be no doubt about the fact that this relationship was one of chaos. Apart from all these other factors that we've been talking about, these experiences of human existence, we know that this relationship was one of chaos. Ladies and gentlemen, what I want to begin this afternoon by doing is reminding you of some of the chaos that we've seen throughout the course of this trial that demonstrates that this idea of premeditation, self-defense, but there could be something else. I want to play for you what's been marked as Exhibit 508. This is a portion of the phone call. You saw and heard this before. This is a portion of the phone call that Travis Alexander and Jody Arias had on May 10th. And listen, if you will, ladies and gentlemen, for the chaos. Big, thick nipples. I 
He covered it, you know. Right there, can I go up and see his He said, I want to get like some like park ranger kind of outfit for me to wear. Oh, I need the pictures I'm going to take. They're so hot. If one of them's going to be me laying on my back, cock hard, you know, stick it straight out. So we'll take some video too. I just did it like 15 pumps. So it's just surprising because, you know, I drank it this morning. Seriously, I could, uh, if I was in a sperm bank, I could have retired off this load. Those were the words of Mr. Alexander. How do they demonstrate chaos? They demonstrate chaos in the context of this entire relationship, don't they? This was from May 10th, May 10th, 2008. A few weeks before the killing, a few days before, about nine days before, he tells Reagan Housley how he's afraid of Jody Arias. Several days later, after this, well, the 26th, he's calling her a whore, a slut, and a three-hole wonder. You've seen these text messages. We've gone over numerous text messages, right? On one day, text message could be sent. Jody was the most beautiful woman in the world. Next day, she could be a horrible bitch. There's text messages referenced to Spider-Man underwear. Text messages sexual in nature. Text messages loving in nature. Chaos. Unhealthy relationship, right? From both parties. There's no doubt about that. Chaos, an emotional turmoil, if you will, that perhaps both individuals were feeling on their own and bringing it in to this relationship, into this caustic relationship. I mean, let's think about it, ladies and gentlemen. We have this relationship that after a few months of going out, we saw what has been marked Exhibit 438. A letter that Jody Arias was motivated, we'll say, to send by Travis Alexander, telling this same Mr. Abduhadi, who's asked Travis was going to kick in the bathroom, that they could no longer be friends or do the things that friends do or do the occasional hug because it would make Travis feel uncomfortable. Chaos. We have on April 7th, 2008, about a month before this phone sex recording, right? Jody is telling an effing lie and this BS story. And no, you know, no matter how bad the truth is, I promise the punishment will be better than the lie. You know, certainly, as Dr. DeMarte would say, not a healthy communication pattern. We also heard, we also saw these text messages without going through every single one. Don't ever contact me again, right? We heard the messages like that from Travis Alexander. And there was always still contact, right? They always kept going back towards each other. No matter what time or space kept them apart, they always kept going back towards each other. There's no doubt about that. It happened all the way up to June 4th. 
Now keep in mind too this time period, this April, May time period, we heard from Mimi Hall, right? And Mimi Hall was hearing stories of Jody being a stalker, right? Again, doesn't make any sense given what was going on. But again, it was this relationship of chaos. And look, let's face facts, this voice of reason, common sense. Travis wanted to maintain this image of a virginal Mormon man. Right? Doesn't seem to be much doubt about that. Deanna Reed told us that. And he's dating these proper Mormon girls, isn't he? Lisa Andrus, Mimi Hall. They're not interested in a sexual relationship with Travis Alexander. But Jody Arias was there, right? Jody Arias was there for him. And we know also, speaking of Lisa Andrews, Lisa Diodone now when she came to testify for you, but then Lisa Andrews, he was dating her. She was the good Mormon girl, right? When he was going to the balloon fest, when he was doing all these different things. And Jody was the dirty little secret on the side. A relationship of chaos. She was great to have around for Mr. Alexander for the sexual purposes. But he wasn't, she wasn't acceptable to his friends. And she might not have been acceptable to his church. So date the Mormon girls. You don't have to have sex with them. You don't have to abuse them. You don't have to push their limits. Even though it seems, based on her own email and her own commentary, that he did push the limits to some degree with Lisa Andrews. She wrote him that email. Don't want you to touch my butt in public to mark your territory. I don't, you know, you talk about sex way too much. You'll have your time. You'll have your chance. Little did she know he already had that, right? Deanna Reed. But that was the reality of what was going on here throughout the course of this relationship. In the time period that he's dating these other girls, flirting with other girls, Jody, for his dictate, has to write Abe a letter and say, no, nah, we can't be friends anymore because it might look upset, Travis. That's, that's what was going on in this relationship, right? On May 2nd, 2008, Travis Alexander sends Miss Aries Exhibit 391. Travis Alexander says, this photo shoot is going to be one of the best experiences of your life or mine. He hasn't stopped thinking about the pics he's going to take. The progressiveness of it from the very clean to the very dirty and everything in between. It will tell quite a story and be a lot of fun and not a day has gone by that I haven't dreamt about driving my shaft long and hard into you. Now keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, although this is before the message to Reagan Housley about being afraid of Jody, this is also around the same time period when he's dating Mimi and saying, I have a stalker. Well, you know, it's funny too, because the state, well, you know, the state says, this is true, he's, she's stalking him. But again, would you send your stalker a message like this about when I'm all by my lonesome, I have no desire to think of anyone else in my scandalous fantasies? Is that a way to tell someone to back off? I don't want to be in a relationship with you? No, it doesn't sound like it to me. Nothing, from my own experience, nothing is even enjoyable compared to you. That's what we talked about love. Hey, right, he loves having sex with Jody Aries, at the very least. Because, because of that, I spent a lot more time getting myself off.
calls her the ultimate slut in bed. How he wants to send one down her throat. He wants her to ride his face. He says, you'll feel like you've been raped. You will enjoy every delightful moment of it. This is someone he's supposedly afraid of, or so the theory goes, right? Someone he wants nothing to do with. Someone in other text messages he calls evil. Someone in other text messages he calls soulless. Of course, we know he did that to other people as well. But he says he calls her a corrupted carcass, right? But it doesn't seem to stop him from having sex with her. One day, you know, he wants to have sex with her and says all these graphic things. Another, you're evil. Well, then maybe, you know, she's a stalker. Now, I need her over here for sex. That's the reality of what common sense tells us what was going on in this relationship. All these things were happening in this time span of May 2008. When this supposed plan was being formulated, these text messages that were being exchanged, these phone calls were being exchanged, and this stalker-like behavior was being exchanged. Showing you what's been marked Exhibit 164. This, talking about this photo shoot. Does that look like that was the best experience of Jody Arias' life? Going back to this idea of the voice of reason and objective evidence that you've heard lots of, and the saying goes, the picture says a thousand words, right? And we have plenty of pictures of the crime scene, and you've heard a lot of testimony about the work that Mesa Police Department did at the crime scene. What was weeks ago now, in January, I think, I had a woman from the Mesa Crime Lab, a crime scene tech, come up and remember she had the laundry. There was laundry and the camera was found in the washing machine. And she showed you all this laundry, all the items that were in there, right? Showing you exhibit 17. There were these socks and there was this towel. And the assumption was that this towel was bleached and that all these items were bleached. Dumped in there, then this was a blood soaked towel with bleach. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you have your common sense. You have the voice of reason. There are other items sitting here in Exhibit 17 that don't seem to have succumbed to this bleach. Exhibit 28, other items found in the washing machine not stained with bleach. Exhibit number 27, items not stained with bleach. What that suggests, what I would say that that should suggest to you is the idea that there was no bleach in this load of laundry. 
there was no effort, if you will, to submerge this camera in water and bleach. And you know, we go back, things come up, and I have to go back to this idea of premeditation as it relates to the camera. The camera was found in there too, remember? Why would somebody who's experienced with digital cameras, who has planned this murder out for weeks, for a week, week and a half, I guess, why would she then not take the camera with her after she has all these crime scene photos she knows she's taken there? Why would she stand there? She's planned this out, right? And she's smart. Why would she delete some photographs and throw it in the washing machine? That doesn't make any sense. And this idea that there was bleach in the washing machine doesn't make any sense either. And these pictures, what we just saw about the, the laundry or the items in the washing machine are things that cannot be changed. They're not, they're subject to your interpretation, I guess, but they are what they are. These were the photographs taken by the Mesa Police Department. What else do we know about this crime scene that tells us a little more? about what happened, what could have happened. Exhibit number 63. We see Travis Alexander's bedroom. And we see a, what I believe is a chair and a half there with some pillows. Now, one of the things that's postulated to you yesterday was the idea that Miss Arias is lying about being tied to the bed. Again, house of cards, knock it down. Lying to you about being tied to this bed because it was a sleigh bed, and there's no way you can do that. Miss Arias talked to you about how the rope went through the back of the bed. And it really wasn't a severe restraint, but more a prop that she could get out of. And they say, no, there's no way that could have happened, but of course it could have. There's no loss of physics or logistics that would prevent someone from being, at least in a, as a prop, tied to the bed in the way Miss Aries described it, right? With both her wrists out, the rope behind the headboard, and tied there. Now, the other issue that comes up as it relates to this objective evidence is the idea of a rope. The argument by the state is there's no rope. Showing you what's been marked as Exhibit 56. What do we see there, ladies and gentlemen? Piece of rope. Now, when Detective Flores was questioned about this, the theory was put forward through the questioning anyway. Well, gee whiz, there's a bunch of fringe on those pillows. That must be where that came from. It looks pretty similar. Must be fringe from the pillows. When I spoke with Detective Flores, he was forced to admit, did those pillows, you know, I asked him something to the effect of, the, were those pillows disheveled? Do they look organized there? And he was forced to admit they looked organized. And you, as jurors, as finder of fact, ultimately can make that decision. But ladies and gentlemen, this theory that this rope was from these pillows doesn't really make any sense either, does it? Looking at Exhibit 268, 
There's a better, better picture of the rope, more close up. Does that make any sense whatsoever as to how a fringe, a piece of fringe from these pillows that were not disturbed wound up on the staircase? Doesn't make any sense. One of the things, you know, talking about memory loss and inconvenient memories. Jody Arias doesn't have the memory of the rope, wasn't there. But here we see, through evidence, again, for which there is no agenda behind it, but a crime scene technician taking this picture. that there's a rope, a piece of rope. Could it be that Jody Aries carried this rope out? Could that be? Well, what else does the crime scene show us? for which there can be no dispute in terms of what happened. Drawing your attention to Exhibit 130, we have the blood the blood at the end of the hallway. Dr. Horn agreed yesterday that that is where the throat was slit. Makes sense, right? The greatest amount of blood loss Presumably, what could be presumed is footprints. That's where his throat was slit. Exhibit 128 shows you a slightly different angle, but it does show you kind of where the blood ends where the pattern is, how far into the room it goes. The state postulated for, for Jody's theory to be correct, there'd have to be blood all the way into the bedroom. But that doesn't make any sense. This, unfortunately, is where it ended. We've heard much about the bullet casing, Exhibit 111. This idea that the shot had to be last because the bullet casing was in blood. Therefore, the stab had to be first. There had to be blood. There's no other way for this bullet casing to wind up here. But ladies and gentlemen, does that make any sense? What I said earlier, and what I think is true from this crime scene, and we're not going to go over every single photograph, but what I said about this crime scene is it is one of chaos as well, isn't it? It shows, it shows passion. It shows anger. It shows rage. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. But things were being moved around, kicked around, and there was a fight. No matter how you, you try to spin anything that happened here, 
There was a fight, and as a state, call it a struggle. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. And yeah, at some point it was probably, it was a fight, a fight for life. On both Jody's part and Travis's part. Now the state during their case in chief showed you exhibit 118. that Jody knew what she was doing, planned all this out because she engaged in some massive cleanup of higher functioning, right? that she was functioning and thinking and acting on a higher level. What's the reality? She threw some water down with a cup in a panic. Does this look like a cleanup? of some cold calculation, or rather instead a reaction, a what the hell happened reaction to what happened, to the experience, the fight she was just in. This does not look like some orchestrated cleanup. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the state had shown you photographs of Mr. Alexander in the shower. We talked about that. Exhibit 159, the photograph that followed of his buttocks and his legs. And it said to you, based on the timing of the photograph of his buttocks and legs, that things could not have happened the way Jody Arias says they happened, that they were part of a pre-plan because it only took 62 seconds, right? That's what we heard in Exhibit 162. The theory is, by the state, that Miss Arias had the weapons she needed to cause Mr. Alexander's death with her, and that she caused it at this point in time. But the picture tells a different story. Dr. Horn was forced to admit on the stand that if someone had their neck slit at this point in time, couldn't keep their head up. Couldn't keep their head up. Well, what do we see in this photograph? It's harder to see on the screen, but we see Mr. Alexander with his head up. And you'll be able to take this back with you. But you can see Mr. Alexander with his head up and his arm up. And we certainly see blood coming from the side. There's no doubt about it. But not a ton. Not the kind of blood you would see had his neck been slit. Not that kind of blood. We actually see that kind of blood in Exhibit 163. Travis Alexander, that's his shoulder. And it is very difficult to see through this projection. And you will have the chance, the opportunity to take a look at this when you deliberate. There's a lot of blood there, ladies and gentlemen. And we know it's not in the bathroom because we can see there's no bathroom counter, there's no light. 
course, keep in mind as well, we don't see a lot of blood splattered around here either. Not at this point. But also keep a look in mind here of this photograph. 533 and 32 seconds. Presumably, ladies and gentlemen, at this point in time, the voice of reason and common sense tells us, going back to Exhibit 249, tells us that Mr. Alexander was being drugged back down the hallway. The end of the hallway is depicted by number 45 on this diagram. And of course we know that Mr. Alexander was ultimately found in the shower. There was carpet in the bedroom. We saw that a moment ago. So when Travis is in this position, presumably what we see here is Jody dragging him back down the hallway towards the shower. The state also says something else in terms of the gunshot, right? That after he's drugged back down the hallway, that Jody Arias shoots him. This gun, she's stolen to kill him. She decides to use it and shoot him, right? Now, there hasn't been any theory specifically postulated as to how that could have happened, right? Not any one theory. We know, though, that the bullet supposedly went through the head in one side and down the other, right? Towards the nasal cavity. So how does this happen, ladies and gentlemen? I don't know if you've given pause to thought to that, but how does this happen? She's dragging this body back. That's pretty obvious. So in theory then, when she's dragging this heavy body back, are we to believe that Jody Arias then stood with Travis down below her and shot him in the head, risking shooting herself? To what end? To what end? Did she prop him up against one of the walls, drag him, drag him, prop him up against a wall, and then walk over and shoot him in this manner? Doesn't seem to make any sense, does it? Did she shoot him in the head when she was in the shower? Well, that doesn't make any sense because he was slumped completely on the ground. She would have had to reach way over and shoot him, right, in the shower. And that doesn't make any sense either, right? It just, this idea that after this, Jody shot Travis after he was dead doesn't make any sense. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what does make sense? I would submit to you, as I submitted to you before this morning, that certainly Jody Arias' theory, or I should say, the explanation that Jody Arias offers makes more sense because it does involve a moment in time. And keep in mind, I think I misspoke a little bit this morning. We talk about this moment in time when he's down. She's left-handed, right? She would have had to go down there with her left hand and stab him. Presumably, she would have used 
her left hand, go down there and stab him, and that's the moment in time the state thinks that premeditation met reality, right? Well, ladies and gentlemen, Here we go. Here's the ultimate question that we asked you the very beginning when Miss Wilmot sat beside you on January 2nd. What happened between here and here? It's also about what happened between this photograph, 162, and photograph 163, what happened? OK. So we know at one point in time, and let me say this. This is to say, if you do not believe Jody Arias' self-defense claim, you believe the states refuted it just by creating a house of cards and knocking it down, What could have happened? We see the shower, 62 and 65, the arrow points towards the shower, where Mr. Alexander's body was found. We know that ultimately, that was the final resting place. We know that the theory that there was a shot, or excuse me, a, a, a stabbing first makes no sense. Because look, look at exhibit 98, if you will. The sink. We have the sink with all this blood splatter. The stage theory is that Mr. Alexander after being stabbed, walked over to the sink with this massive wound in his chest and stood there. Now, presumably for the blood to hit this sink and not the mirror, not somewhere else, and as we saw Mr. Martinez do yesterday, you know, we have a palm print there. He's leaning forward. Right? He's leaning forward, he has a hand on the sink, and that is where the state theorizes that Jody Arias then, after stabbing him in the chest, for some reason, backs up, because he's down, he's got this chest wound, right? He, this is a fatal wound. He has it, and he's sitting in the shower when he has it. That somehow he gets up, gets past Miss Arius, who's got the knife in her hand, keep in mind still, and that once he gets past Miss Arius and he stumbles to the counter, He's standing there, bleeding out his chest, and splattering all this blood. And that based on what the state told us yesterday, Miss Arias then comes behind Mr. Alexander to stab him in the back. We showed you the photographs of Mr. Alexander's autopsy and these cluster, this cluster of nine wounds. But keep in mind the testimony of Dr. Horn the first time. These nine wounds were all real shallow. Shallow wounds. Now under the state's theory, 
they claim that Jody Arias leaned down, grabbed the knife, and stuck it into Mr. Alexander in an awkward backhand position and was able to penetrate his chest and damage his heart and go deep, deep wound, right? But when she's standing up with her full force and Mr. Alexander is standing over there, that all she could concede in doing is making these very shallow wounds. All her strength, right? She's standing up. Yet she can't make the kind of damage she did when, when he's in the, that he supposedly did when he's sitting in the shower. That doesn't make any sense, does it? Keep in mind as well, the theory goes that she was out to slit his throat. Well, there he is, right? Bent over the counter, bleeding out his chest, according to the state. Jody has this knife still in her hand. Why wouldn't she just come behind him and cut him? <coughs> Instead, we have these superficial, not superficial, but we have these shallow stab wounds. Why would she do that? It doesn't make any sense. The other thing is, it doesn't make any sense, again, going back to the gun. She has this gun, right? She has stabbed this guy. Somehow he has gotten past her, and he's standing at the sink. Again, it makes very little sense how he could get up with this wound, get past her, and get to the sink. But under the state's theory, that's what she does. That's what he does, right? Well, Jody Arias, if you believe the state, had a gun at the ready. Did she shoot him there when he was standing over this sink? Did he drop right there? No. We know that from the crime scene photographs. We know that at a particular point in time that he walked down the hallway and you saw all the blood and all the chaos going down that hallway and all throughout the bathroom. And we saw yesterday the blood smear on the hall. There's no doubt about the fact that, yeah, Mr. Alexander fell at that point in time, fell somewhere near the end of the hallway in that bedroom. But how did he get there? If the state's theory is correct, he never would have gotten there. If the state's theory is correct, he never would have gotten there. Because Jody Arias had the implementation, the implements of Travis's destruction, and evidently, based on this theory, she didn't use them. None of what the state has said to you as it relates to what happened that day, apart from a few very specific things, make sense. Dr. Horn may have been right the first time before he or Detective Flores changed his story about the shot being first, but of course the self-defense claim caused them to alter that. I would submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that you also have to consider the possibility, as you do in your manslaughter instruction, that some point, some point after this photograph, something happened. Something obviously happened, right? Maybe that's silly of me to say, but something happened. The question is what? What? 
The chances for premeditation have gone by the wayside, at least from the pictures we saw this morning. I would submit to you that, in fact, Jody Harris did drop the camera. We have evidence of a picture of the ceiling. Did drop the camera. That Travis Alexander did berate her for dropping his camera, the camera he was going to take to Cancun. And while we're thinking of Cancun, we didn't hear it from the state yesterday, but this idea about Cancun and how jealous Jody would be, right? They talked about, listen to the recording on May 10th, they talked about all these trips they were going to take, all these things. And she told you she knew someone else was going. This wasn't a matter of jealousy. Not on her part, anyway. But I would submit to you that she did drop the camera, that Travis Alexander did fly into a rage, the kind of rage and kind of anger you've seen in the text messages and in the recordings, that he did threaten her and make her feel as if her life was in jeopardy. Because remember, her perspective on this is that of a battered woman. But ladies and gentlemen, there's no doubt about the fact. One of the things Alice Violet said was that sometimes when a battered woman is attacked and they're defending their life, they don't know when to stop. Travis Alexander's body was stabbed 27 times. It may be that Jody Arias didn't know when to stop. It could also be, without any agenda looking at it objectively, couldn't it also be that after everything, everything they went through in that relationship, that she threw him down again, that she did grab for the gun to defend herself, that after that, she simply snapped. She may not know it, but she may very well have snapped. out of control, sudden heat of passion. We have been through so much, and look what happened now. This instance of violence went too far. She could have snapped. Snapping, sudden heat of passion, could account for much of what you see throughout the various pictures that were taken in Exhibit 249. The chaos, the blood everywhere, the shallow stab wounds, the slit to the throat, the running down the hall. All of it, in some ways, a sad, symbolic ending to a, re a toxic relationship. All of it. It was a fight. But Jody Arias might very well have lost control. She might very well have come in and exceeded, succeeded or gave in to a sudden quarrel and heat of passion after Travis Alexander threw her down. Enough was enough. And no doubt for a minute, those, those things are there. Those text messages, everything else. This chaos. This relationship, the fear, the love, the sex, the lies, and the dirty little secrets. And throw her on the ground again. And go in a situation where she has to point a gun at him. And him diving towards her. Ladies and gentlemen, again, with no agenda behind it, not Miss Arias' voice, not the state's voice, is that the most logical explanation for what happened. You have to consider that, ladies and gentlemen. It's in your jury instructions, and that's one of the things that you decide. What happened? 
That ultimate question, we've seen those two pictures over and over again. What happened in that moment in time? A relationship. A relationship of chaos. That ended in chaos as well. There is nothing about what happened on June 4th in that bathroom that looks planned. Nothing. You bring a gun, and instead you stab. You have his back to you with a, with a gun and a knife, and you don't do anything. If it was planned, wouldn't you? So we talked about this morning. This idea about something happening. Something did happen in this moment of time. And the point of this, I think, is what this evidence shows you is that either what happened is that Jody Arias defended herself and didn't know when to stop, or she gave in to a sudden heat of passion from a fight that began up in that bathroom. And that what she did, she did under that sudden heat of passion. Demonstrative of that is this idea, she doesn't remember any of it. So what I'm saying to you, ladies and gentlemen, is ultimately, if Miss Arias is guilty of any crime at all, it is the crime of manslaughter and nothing more. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a 10 minute recess. Please be back in the designated area in approximately 10 minutes. Remember the admonition, you are excused. We are at recess. <clears throat>